Um, welcome, Nate Turner here. Sorry, oh, no. we don't have this yet. Um, <laughs> Nate Turner, he is a former board member with the Lucas County Board of DD, right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> The view is a loud and awesome cheering section. I love y'all. And he now works for DODD. And we also have Steve Oster. He's the superintendent of Coshocton and Knox County Board. And he also has a lot of experience getting people with disabilities on his board. So they are going to present DODD's toolkit that they're creating to help people with disabilities um, get have a better experience getting on boards. So. Getting on county boards of developmental disabilities, but I think part of this is also the system really looking at broader opportunities to serve throughout the community, helping folks who want to serve in their communities realize what they want to do and marshal the supports to do the things they want to do. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. You've arrived at the caboose session. And I, I, I don't know if, you know, that's an honor or a challenge, but I will do my best to really make this a fun and engaging experience for you all. Um, I have a slide deck, but feel free, you know, if any of you have specific questions about certain requirements related to appointing somebody on the board or just want to share experiences. Yeah, you know, this time is for me to hear from you all about what is going well and what isn't. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nate Turner. I've been at DODD about a year and a half now since November of 2022. Largely focused on supporting uh, Sorry about that. Largely focused on supporting adults with developmental disabilities with systems navigation, resources, and information on the Ohio Life Force Nexus Project. But I also am sort of leading the department's support initiatives around the changes in county board governance that are effective July 1 of 2025. But about one in four county boards already have somebody who is supported within the system serving on their board of directors. So this is something that is currently happening now. And we're really evaluating the best practices in supporting people with developmental disabilities on county boards and also on broader community boards. And Steve, I don't know if you want to take a second to introduce yourself. I know everybody knows you and you're the nicest guy in the room. But <laughs> It lies a lot, but thank you. Steve Oster, the superintendent for Knox and Coshocton County Board of DD. Um, we put someone on the board in 2013, so we were the first county to put an individual on the board with a disability. My board felt like back then, how do you serve people with disabilities and not have them represented at the table? Um, it was a little controversial. We did that. The commissioners had some discussions about can they do it? Are they appropriate people? Who are you putting on the board? What does that mean for the community? Can they can they vote on, do they pay taxes? All those questions came up and you know, after a conversation and meeting, it was, Latasha was the first person, meeting Latasha, they kind of fell in love with her as we privatized, which has been a long time ago for us. She was at the table saying why it was important for her, what it meant to her personally. And then she ended up mentoring a new board member that came on after that. So her role moved up. She moved up into the role of secretary, and then she left the board for some personal reasons after that. But we got to see the experiences of someone with a disability on the board being really proactive and very positive to the community. So we've had four people since then between both counties um, serving on the boards. They have not all worked out, and I'll talk about that later, but there are things you want to think about as you put people on the board. And this is not just people with disabilities. It's really anybody, community member, Whoever it is, it's the same concept for anybody. So we don't want you to think this presentation is about people with disabilities. It's about any board member across the board. Interesting thing about Ms. Fraley and I is that we kind of left for, from what I understand, on her end, mostly employment reasons. And mine was an entirely employment-related reason for how I, or why I had to leave the board. But it goes to show that people living with disabilities can use serving on volunteer boards as a way to gain really vital experiences 
and leadership and be able to marshal those skills into competitive employment. It's true. And Latasha had served at the delegate assembly during the OACB conference in December that year. She was the first person with a disability to actually just be a delegate at the at the room, which was pretty historic because people were asking why she was there. And she said, I'm on a board. Why, why wouldn't I be here? So interesting to see people's perspectives on that as well. So I'm, I told Nate, I'm the background. Nate is your eye candy and I'm just the background person for Nate. So. No, 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 it's fine. And I think we're just at a moment where, yes. yeah, the technology is changing and it's allowing us to accommodate people in new and exciting ways. But I think also there has been a real shift in the way society thinks about disability and this mindset that we're all navigating life together, whether or not we can live with a disability. And in all actuality, up to one in four of us live with disabilities, but I think a, a significant number of those acquire disabilities through aging. And when you know, you know about, you know, the struggles of living with a disability. And it's just representative that we're moving forward and really thinking about all of the people that we share a society with and the best ways to support everybody to live the life that they want to live. And just as a review of some of the legislative changes that have occurred, it's Ohio Law Section 5126021 that mandates the changes in county board composition. And in chief, it mandates that Every county board has to have an adult living with a developmental disability by July 1 of 2025. And that doesn't mean that every county board is going to be compliant by that. But it does mean that they ha we have to be working toward compliance by that point. And obviously, vacancies and the availability of vacancies are going to impact that timeline for individual county boards. And the goal here really is to just make sure that we have that representation, the voice of what effectively is the end customer for county boards, the people that rely on the services you all authorize and provide. And as I said, this is effective July 1 of 25. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Just remember the seats for the boards when you have a board opening. So one question that comes up is, I have a board member who term ends in December of this year. Are they allowed to be reappointed for another term? Yes, they are. So you don't have to end someone's term to put somebody on the board. For some county boards, this might be four or eight years off because if you have board members who are all new, your time frame might be longer periods than others. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. And very briefly, a reminder that you are all now permitted to have electronic attendance at county board meetings. At least one third of the members have to be present and votes are done by all. And by rule, it has to be requested at least 48 hours in advance. But what I appreciate about this is that it's available to all members on the county board of DD, but this exception is specific to county boards of DD. And, I'm, and also, every member has to attend at least 50% of the board meetings. So that is just something to keep in mind as you're creating these policies. But it really is a way for the members of the community who are volunteering their time, whether they have a disability or not, to serve more effectively and in a way that's more convenient for them. Like and so um, a lot of you know that I'm working on a toolkit that really talks about you know, the, the go this governance issue. And one of the things that was really important to me is that the toolkit leads with what people with developmental disabilities can offer to the county boards as members. 
And first and foremost is highlighting the unique perspective they have as somebody who receives the supports. They have a day-to-day -day view. And often, you know, we have relationships with people who also have day-to-day -day view to give unique insight on how services and supports strengthen their lives, but they can also hamper their lives, even though we intend for these services to really broaden horizons for the people we support. That may not always be the case because of because of capacity issues and turnover and or personalities just may not mesh. And there's often a gap between what a person expects from their services and wants from their services versus keeping someone healthy and safe and really focusing on, you know, the nuts and bolts of of what an ISP might say. And sometimes it's not all captured. And it's important for a board of directors to really value that diverse input of the people that are being supported by the agency. Because it's common practice for agencies to have folks on their board who are their core constituency. And I also think it really just highlights the importance of dignity and, and inclusion in the services that the county boards offer. And no one is going to wake up, you know, living with a disability or not and say, I lived a dignified life today. But it's important that the entire organization really focuses on its mission and serves to respect and uplift and empower people living with disability. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay. And I also think just as direct customers, having people with disabilities on board gives a lens of accountability to the community while also being a representation that you know, children living with disabilities grow up to become adults. And maybe the perception of some families is that they aren't sure what we can do on our own. So being there gives us a chance to demonstrate competency and really be respected in the community and valued for the skills that we provide. And I think most importantly for me, this is going to encourage the county boards to adopt a philosophy of self-direction. One second. It's gonna encourage the county boards to adopt a philosophy of self-direction and really put some additional responsibility, provide opportunities and additional responsibility for the people living with disabilities to kind of take control of their lives, which includes managing more of their services and supports. I know we went through a lot pretty quickly. Does anybody have any immediate feedback or any questions about what people could offer the electronic changes or the mandate changes? Okay, I, I know it's a long day and it's a lot to process. Steve, do you have anything you want to add? <laughs> yes. Nate's a great speaker. That's the best part about it. Nate knows his stuff. It's interesting because I hear people say, I don't have a Nate Turner living in my county. How do I find someone to be on the board? And you hate to hear those things, but that's what people say. I don't have a Christine Brown, if you know Christine. I don't have a Nate Turner. So how do I find somebody as eloquent? that can have the passion and do what we do. And, and you've really got to start thinking, how do you develop people? And we're going to get into that. How do you develop people to really get ready to be on boards? It was sad when I asked my SSAs initially, give me one person on your case that you think could be a good board member. And I got two names. I went to the SSA meeting going, you mean out of 650 people, there's only two people in the whole county board that you think can actually sit on a board? Well, the faces got a little red. I'm like, that's pretty bad. If you're advocating for people and that's the best you can do, maybe we don't have the right people hired in this room. And they kind of laughed and they started stepping up their game. So it's gotten better, but it was embarrassing to try to find out anybody on the caseloads that 
they even thought could be on a board. Well, I, I think you have a strong team, so so it's not about you know maybe if the names don't flow immediately because it is a lot to serve on a county board, and let's face it, it's not the most interesting thing in the world. Well, that's <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it's a lot of work and you're effectively donating your time. So I, I think part of it is coming to the table with uh, clear, you know, clear insight on where a person, how they can be helpful, but also what they'll gain out of the opportunity, you know, a chance to really make connections to work with some great people at the county board who are focused on a core mission to you know learn about the finances of an organization to gain some skills for professional development and growth but also make connections with leaders in the community and, and you know you gain some additional respect and you're also playing a vital role in representing the voice of people being supported on the county board of DD. And yeah, it's just a reminder of, you know, the adult with a disability is one of the primary reasons the county board system exists to support us in having fulfilling lives and to be able to have a front row seat into making decisions that are going to affect other people with DD is quite an honor. I also think bigger than that, the conversation should be about any board in your community. Do you have anybody with a disability serving on a baseball team board, a church board, United Way, Salvation Army, Kiwanis? My guess is in the room, probably maybe one person, if anybody has anybody serving on a board. That's where the discussion needs to get to because you want representation. When the mayor calls and says, do you have someone who can help me with handicapped accessible crosswalks? Who is that person? We have a committee together. You should have in your head names, and those people should be advocating for themselves. So you really want to have people prepared to get on boards. That's the best sell when it comes for levy time, for the knowledge that people with disabilities bring together. I mean, it's really important to get them involved in the community. And, and we think at this point in time, a lot of people, we have to put someone on a DD board, but keep thinking bigger because it's all about your community and what do you do to enhance the community with that. But there's a million boards out there looking for people every day and you have to get experience somewhere. DD boards are pretty structured. I think it's I call it, there's like A, B, C level boards, like A are boards that are pretty governance and C are like hands-on working boards. Figuring out where people fit in those boards is kind of where you want to try to, what's the, figure out where to put people, where they, where they have an interest to be in. You might have to use the microphone. Um, she's also my coworker, but um, she has recently been um, appointed to the HRC council and um, she's had a couple meetings and I've heard like great things about it. I mean, she's participating. They're loving it. Like just multiple people in the committee were like really excited um, about her perspective and stuff like that. So kind of the same direction. Um, it's been really positive. I'm glad that she's willing to participate on the Human Rights Committee. Yeah, that's legally required for the boards. And, you know, we really try to have somebody supported on them. And that's another opportunity for folks who are interested in providing leadership to serve if a county board vacancy is already taken or not immediately available. Thank you. That's a really good point. And I would also say that I served on my human rights council for about nearly five years and that was kind of a stepping stone to the board seat. i just want to say we implemented a board liaison program um, in dark county <clears throat> to help people with um, developmental disabilities come to our board and have a better understanding of what does our board do is it something they will be interested in in the future as a way to kind of gain some interest because a lot of people say, I wanna be on the board. Um, and I had somebody do that. Um, she thought she was gonna go gung ho so that when we had the next appointment, she was ready. What she realized was it wasn't what she thought it was going to be and she did not like it. So um, although it, it was a not a win for us, um, it helped her learn that um, serving as a board member was a little more 
difficult than what she thought it might be. And she really didn't, um, didn't think that was an avenue that she wanted to pursue. But so she, you can, it's, it, it was good and bad. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. I think that type of a model where you invite the community or, you know, maybe if you want to do a really clear language version and target, you know, the folks you support, that's an approach. But I also like to involve the community as well and maybe focus on inviting the appointing authorities one day and then also inviting leadership one day to just talk about what they do at the county board in different departments and then, you know, inviting folks to maybe attend a board meeting so it's kind of a layered approach. And if you open it up to the community, you know, that's just another opportunity to make some really great connections. But I love that approach. I love that you're learning from engagements. And as I said, not everybody is going to be willing to serve on a county board because it is, you know, somewhat of a higher level experience. And, you know, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. So if someone what? realizes, hey, this isn't what I want to do, I think that's a better investment of time and they can work with their team to figure out leadership opportunities that meet their interests rather than apply and then realize three months down the line they don't like it and they stop showing up. We spent some time during COVID. We had um, Zoom calls a lot with groups of people. And one of the things we talked about was board training for people who want to be on board. So it was community members and people with disabilities, both. The mayor came on to one session saying, this is what it's like to be on the board because it does city council. I came on there to talk about what boards were, but it was very beneficial for people to hear just some basics, like you have to be on time. This is what a board looks like. There's things you follow. This is how you can be active and engaged. But those kind of sessions, there were just 15 minute sessions that we did once a month for people, but it really got people's interest to say, I love it, or I have no desire to waste my time to be on a board. Or like Nate said, it sounds really boring and I'd rather go do something else. So I think there's opportunities you can build skill sets with anybody, community members or people with disabilities ahead of time. Yeah, one of the things I'm noticing when, I, when I'm doing my rounds and talking about this is folks are saying, thanks for letting me know serving on a board is a lot more nuanced than I realized. And maybe that's not what I want to do with my time. And I really, I think it's important for us to help identify candidates that want to serve so that when we're developing relationships with county commissioners, even though you know boards don't do the appointments, but I think board leadership, you know, would do well to maintain relationships with the appointing authorities, and they can occasionally recommend folks to the appointing authority. Do you want to speak? Yeah, appointing authorities are interesting. So my county, if I say the commissioners of the probate judge, I want to have three people on my board. They're going to say, "Yep, we're going to put them on your board." On occasion, they might interview people. If you go to Cuyahoga County; it's really more about politics and maybe Republican, Democrat, who you are. So really building that relationship with your commissioners, probate judges to try to get some authority to give good names to them is helpful. But we always try to give names because it certainly it's hard to turn down someone's face. Like if Nate came in the room and wants to be on the board, it's hard to say no to him if he's physically down there meeting him ahead of time. Yeah, I, I would say in my experience, that was a critical point to me getting appointed was I started about a year before a before I was appointed to the board, I started working toward being appointed. I had a conversation with my superintendent about my interest and they indicated a vacancy might be coming available, asked me if I was interested, talked a little bit about what it would mean. And I had gone to a few county board meetings and also a few county commissioner meetings as well at that point. But I continued to do those things as I was preparing a year in advance to apply. Um, and then I, I think I had had some phone calls with the superintendent and with the county commissioners and so on. And eventually I went through a 
I don't want to call it a formal application process, but that what that's what it was. I filled out some forms, um, I signed some statements, and had to submit a resume to the county commissioners that I was appointed in December of 2020. But the key is I wasn't a stranger to the appointing authorities. I think usually about at least quarterly, roughly, to be we we had representation from the county commissioners at our at our board meetings. So they were regularly attending our board meetings and interested to know, you know, in what the work was. And I use that opportunity to network with them. So if you all know when your appointing authorities are coming, that would be an opportunity for interested people to meet with the appointing authorities, just so that there's a connection there. <clears throat> and it's not just an application they're reviewing. How many people are board members in the room? So as a board member, I'm curious, do you understand the finances? Like, would you say you're 100%, you get the finances, you're like 50% or you're kind of not so good? So 50% understand finances, different board, but you have finances on your board, correct? And do you understand the finances when they present them? So when you think about people with disabilities, everybody thinks you have to understand everything. You don't because your expertise, either one of you, your expertise is not finances. You're on the board for other reasons, most likely. You bring something else to the table. That's a, that's a good person that understands finances, but everybody has a talent you bring to the board. So don't feel like everybody has to understand the whole board because nobody does. I sit on a domestic violence board. I get 75% of it, not all of it, but there's pieces I get and they talk about all these grants and I'm like, I don't even begin to understand your funding always, but you try to learn it, but you don't have to know everything to be on a board. And that's a good key to remember as people come on boards. I've served on boards for my legal aid for about five years now. And I don't know every aspect of, of all the finances or understand it in depth. I do know, you know, how to read and interpret a 990 and and things like that. Uh, um, but I, I do agree with Steve that you can't understand everything. And each of the board's board members have a strength. In my case, you know, I have a lot of experience navigating public benefits and, you know, people using work incentives to support work. So when our board was reviewing employment first policies and tech first policies and yeah, how they were gonna use stable accounts or treat stable accounts, I had a lot of input there. And that's where, you know, the perspective of somebody living with a disability can really be valued, or at least one instance. And, I, and just to go back to the presentation a, a little bit, I think part of the reason we focus so much on broader community leadership opportunities is because you know, these formal slots are going to be limited. There are only 88 county boards and 88 slots for people designated as for people living with developmental disabilities and so many slots on DD Council and so forth. So a lot of folks, when, when they think about these leadership opportunities, they could point to the systemic ones, when in reality, we have Rotary, we have churches, we have Toastmasters, we have action clubs, we have community nonprofits, legal aids, organizations that need committed board members. It's interesting, we have a leadership construction program, Leadership Knocks through the Community. In Coshocton, we've been trying to get someone through that program with a disability, and the lady that ran it was pretty adamant that wasn't going to be the case because they couldn't they couldn't give enough to the group. And the lady went through this year, and she graduates next month from the program, and she has called me and said she's been the best thing in the program. People have learned from her. She has learned from people. She has stepped up. We are just amazed at, like, the breadth of what she brought to the leadership group. So they're already calling me saying we have somebody next year that can also bring the same perspective in. So... Again, think about leadership programs in your community, how to get people involved in those, because they're another avenue to get your message out, but also get people the experience they need. And I know you all are mostly focused on communications, but 
when I think about the role of county board staff in supporting the initiative, I, I think SSAs are always the front line of contact, the you know the gatekeeper, if you will, if you look at the image on the screen. And, and I see their role as really helping the people they support think about what type of leadership opportunities fit their interests and what types of supports would they need to serve more effectively, whether it's transportation or technology or um, physical support, and then planning around, using those to plan opportunities that meet their interest. And if counties have a vacancy for an adult with DD and need support, then the SSA could work with board leadership um, and those conversations could begin. And charting the life course is really a great set of tools for anybody to help solve diverse problems. But in this case, it was designed to be really accessible for people living with disabilities. And it could be a great way for folks to think about their strengths and contributions for a board um, when they're planning out what they would like to do and how they like to spend their time. Um, and as far as at the administrative level, I think it's important for board leadership to evaluate the membership profile and really think about upcoming vacancies and relationships that they have in the community with either government or nonprofit organizations that could also need board members. And some other leadership roles, I think we've already talked a lot about this, but within the system, Project STIR is an entry level kind of advocacy and leadership education rights assertiveness for adults with DD. Ideally, I would say it's most effective between 16 and 22, but I know that transition for a lot of our folks doesn't, you know, it, it may, it's not on a solid timeline. And so some folks are a little older when they go through it, but I like Project STIR because it's fun and relatable and accessible. Um, the Ohio Self-Determination Association has a statewide network of peer trainers that facilitate the Project STIR training. So it's peer-to-peer -peer leadership education. And so that's really important. Beyond Project STIR, We've got the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council and their associated meetings. Uh, policy stakeholder groups at DODD also come to mind. We've got action clubs. We've got community leadership organizations. Um, and then also other local, regional, or federal committees. I know there, there's a large presidential committee on intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I know a few folks who served on that. Um, and there's everything to, yeah, in, in my experience, I've served on legal aids and they always need, in my experience, good qualified board members because that's a, another organization, you know, that needs volunteer board members to do really important, but not necessarily exciting work. Um, and beyond that, I think really looking at the staff of our county boards and our department and organizations that support people living with disabilities, to, you know, we need to have employment and staff representation of disability as well so that the work we're doing is truly representative of uplifting the people we support. And we also have a myriad of local advocacy groups. I know Salute in Toledo, Erie County Corps, several of you have action clubs um, or COGS. We'll have groups for adults with DD to come together and learn from shared experiences. Are there, are there any other community organizations that you all think would be impactful to include on this list.
Thoughts? All right, it's the end of the day. We we've got twenty minutes. We will get through this. And well, <laughs> okay. I, I built I built some conversational pieces in here, and I can see that's going to be a little bit of a challenge for this room at this time. I honestly think it's the baklava. You know, I had a bit of a sugar crash myself. And <laughs> so I get it. Steve, do you want to talk uh, from your experience? What do you think contributes to a successful or unsuccessful tenure on a county board or any other organization? That yeah, it's interesting. We've had, we've had successes and failures. So our second person, which was the first in Knox, got on the board and worked at Kroger, thought we'd be a great fit came to the first meeting and said, I want to do picnics for the community. We should have a picnic every month for everybody. And I'm like, hmm, what do I do with that? And about the third meeting in, she had work issues and finally had to leave the board within the first six months. But it really wasn't in her head what she thought it was going to be. So it was a kind of bad planning on my part, not having more conversations like you do with any board member, and bad planning on her part, not really understanding what she was walking into. So if you put someone on the board, I always say there's things you want to think about you certainly want to recruit people, try to find people who would be good to be on your boards. Have people attend a board meeting ahead of time if you can, just to know what they're walking into and what a board meeting looks like. You know, some boards are 15, 20 minutes, some board meetings are three hours for counties. And I feel sorry for the counties who have three hour board meetings, but it depends where you live. And some are very efficient and some just have lots to talk about. You certainly want to um, assign a mentor to somebody. So I always say a mentor, like when you walk in, you want someone to feel welcome. So I hate when I walk into a board meeting and I see the person with a disability at the end of the table not included. So I always think in my head, when we put someone on the board, where do you seat them? That's important at the table. Are they Usually it's beside me or beside the president. That way they feel like they're part of the group and they're important to be at the group. Um, we'll talk ahead of time about just what to expect. You're going to have a packet ahead of time. You're going to have to read the packet. But you have to think through how do you deliver the packet. So my HR director sent out the packet to our newest board member via email, and she missed the first meeting completely. So I called her and said, do you want to come to the meeting? She's like, yeah. I said, did you check your email? Well, no, if you just text me stuff and text me to tell me I have an email, then I'll look at it and get it. So I'm like, okay, I can do that. I had to think what her mode of communication was. I also have a lady with a visual impairment I want to bring on. She's almost legally blind, but I know how to make that work for her. And she's able to tell me exactly how to get the packets to her. So it's just that thinking, but it also changes the board meeting because all the board members are going to look it's going to look different at a board meeting. If someone has visual impairments, it's going to be different visuals, different cues. So it's also helping your board members understand this is how your structure is going to be different as people come on your board. And it's not a bad thing. It's just an educating people as you go along, which I think is important. When you're on a board, it's really odd because you don't know what to expect. You come into a room, any board you sit on the first meeting, you really have no idea what they're talking about. So it's really important to spend some time before and after the meeting checking in to see how the person did, what do you need, what follow-up do you need, but just make sure they're feeling engaged and welcome for that first couple months. That's where a mentor comes in handy because a mentor will do that work for you, and that's helpful. And if you can mentor someone to give them that support, the hands-on, it just keeps someone engaged where you want to keep them to. But then let that person become a mentor for the next new board member that comes along so they have the same experiences, and I think that's helpful. It absolutely is. I, I um I certainly agree with just little things like placement can make a big difference in perception. And, and I, I know that, you know, in Lucas County, we kind of learned that along the way, and I, and I was grateful for it. I also think that it's important sometimes for staff to offer a board packet review, and that might all also mean extra preparation in advance, but just to be prepared to deliver or present board information in a different way so that it's more accessible to everybody. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, in some of the larger counties, I think the consent agenda can potentially cover, you know, millions of dollars in relatively straightforward contracts sometimes. Or uh, I've even had some organizations where the financials are covered in the consent agenda. And it's important to, you know, know what that means. It's one vote, but you're voting on a lot of things. You know, that one vote isn't a simple thing. So it can just be 
offering a agenda review or packet review the week before the meeting uh, and making it available to all board members. Because, you know, if the packets are large, I don't know that we can guarantee that everybody will devote the time to read the entire thing. And so having time to read and review materials together, I think can be one of the most important things to make sure that the organization is making an informed decision. Spend a little time introductions, getting to know the people on the board. So like when we do a board training, we actually go to our winery, which is a great place to do a board training. People kind of hang out, it's very casual. We do a couple of fun activities for the board members, which they love because you get to know each other. And then we do our training on usually interesting topics, not boring, but it makes people feel like part of a team, always mission driven, always mission mission focused. So every meeting starts out with our mission statement. Everybody knows what it is, it's five words. I mean, everybody's got it. So everything we talk about is mission driven. So people are on the same page moving forward. And really quick about navigating the DD board process. And I know we've talked about this, making sure that we set expectations, we help people to understand their strengths so that they know what they're getting into. We really want to have collaborative discussions, whether it's at the team level with the SSA or with county board leadership prior to somebody applying to be on the board. Ideally, they will have gone to several meetings so that they know what to expect. And then also opportunities to meet with the appointing authorities. They're often public officials at other meetings. Um, and so it's good to just make the connection. And it's also a reminder to applicants that they are, in fact, your local government representatives, and, it, and it's an opportunity to engage on a multitude of issues. And then, you know, just networking in the community is critical and really valuing relationships and, and social capital um, would be really important, I, I think, for folks to get at, you know, why, why, why it's important for them to do what they do and, and fully understand um, how they can effectively contribute as a board member and their purpose for being there is that they represent the community at large and it's, it's not just about, you know, an individual decision. So having relationships throughout the community would be really helpful. I don't know if you have anything. I just, I just have a I just have a question. What did you want to get out of this session today? So we we can talk for hours about things, but you came here for a reason. Either you came here because you had nowhere else to go, you came here because you wanted to see Nate Turner talk, which is awesome, or you were bored and didn't want to do something. Like, what did you want to get out of the session today? Do you have questions? Do you have thoughts? Is there something in your head you go, I'm trying to figure out this aspect of it, or you just thought the topic might be interesting? Yep. I'll run. So you were talking about like local leadership opportunities as far as like um, leadership classes or workshops or something like that. Uh, what have you had any experience with some of these smaller groups, um, maybe with pushback on making special accommodations or, you know, a person not having the accessibility that they need for taking something like that or getting into something like that? I haven't heard I haven't heard a lot of feedback, but I also don't know that there is a you know direct feedback mechanism for folks who have gone through those programs to kind of say, you know, well, that didn't go so well in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a lot of times if folks with disabilities aren't well accommodated we can, you know, we might have a tendency to just deal with it and then not deal with it again, as opposed to kind of confronting the individual or asking for more because we don't want to be seen as needy. And I think that sort of mindset needs to shift, but it also needs to be understood as we're thinking about supporting this county board governance initiative. We want to foster an environment where folks are 
we want people to take the lead in asking for accommodations or just ways they can be supported to serve effectively, whether they have a disability or not. But we also want to make sure that they feel supported and that they can ask for accommodations. I actually address accommodations um, in one of the upcoming slides, but I think often if something doesn't go well, you know, we just don't hear about it and they give up. Yeah. And the reason I asked that question is just because I was thinking about that in my head. And, and you know, we do have a few of those programs and one that I'm thinking of in particular. Um, I could see accessibility challenges with this group just because of some of the things that they do. They, they're, it's just not accessible for certain, you know, people with disabilities, with certain types of dis disabilities. But there are ways around that and accommodations can be made. So I think it's, you know, comes down to like having that person having, like you said, just the the audacity to be able to say, hey, I need this. But if they don't, having someone that can help them say that. Absolutely. And I think that's yet another reason why Director Hauk pushed so hard for this is people in the system need to see folks like themselves in leadership positions to feel comfortable asserting their rights in some cases. If I can add leadership Kashakton, they do agricultural day, they do social services day. The courthouse is not accessible on the third floor where they take people. So they actually did videos so the person could see it. Agricultural day, they actually shifted how they were doing it so people could be accommodated. But a lot of that goes back to the county board having a relationship with community members. So I think a lot of times county boards stay siloed. You do your thing and your track, mental health does their thing, but sometimes people aren't really always community focused. And I mean community focused more than talking about levies and a dinner, but really diving into the community. So just a quick example, our accreditation five years ago, we had six community members come in, Chamber of Commerce, Domestic Violence, Head Start, to talk to the creditors about DD. We weren't there. Like I said to them, we're not gonna be in the room. I don't know what they're gonna tell you. We didn't prep them. I thought 10 minutes, they're going to be done talking an hour and 15 minutes later i'm like what's going on in the room they talked for an hour and 15 minutes and could have talked for five hours about what dd does and how we're integrated and what it means to them and how supportive they are that let us know on that day that we truly have made the impact in the community we need to so when we when we talk about these kind of things people on the head start thinking they're important they're players how do we make sure we're including them in different sessions but you got to kind of build that network all the time we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to kind of expedite the last section of the presentation. We've talked about a lot of this already. It's I I was wearing off. Podcast. Listen to it if you haven't. It's linked in the presentation. I did a specific episode with Michael Richards. He's the president of Ohio People First, and he's the vice president of Island DD. So I highly recommend that listen. And we've already talked about how to build skills, but really, you know, just don't hesitate to ask for help. I am a resource and we want to be flexible, patient and creative with finding solutions and supporting people to serve in leadership capacities where they like. Inclusive participation, I, I referenced accommodation earlier. It's really important to have those conversations early but they need to be led by the board member. But again, really connecting with the superintendent and having a pipeline to leadership should be a way to kind of identify how county boards can support any potential member to serve more effectively in advance. And some accommodations you might think about are ways you can use technology to communicate more effectively and thinking about ways um, ways that you might need to change the way you traditionally communicate um, for all board members, whether it's presenting documents in a different way, having that agenda review I suggested, you know, maybe you send out an email with text message reminders, uh, things like that. And you also want to think about what types of transportation and other supports are available. And some of this might be 
reimbursable expenses, but being clear about what reimbursable expenses are in the beginning is important. Um, and also, you know, going back to eligibility specific supports, uh, really having that conversation with the SSA about what resources are available to support somebody. And for people that need attendance, I know this question has come up a lot. Um, and I'm working with the department, um, specifically with executive session uh, to make sure or to figure out what an appropriate response would be. And I'm hoping to let you know more about that in time. But I think just through communication, um, the attendant attends as a member of the public. And if sensitive information needs to be discussed in the executive session and the attendant needs to be present, you know, that's something internally boards can discuss and hopefully resolve at a time. And I also think, yeah, as Steve mentioned, we want to think about seating arrangements and accessible stages and that type of thing. We want to set it up so that everybody feels welcome, uh, but that it's also accessible. So, you know, if I'm using a wheelchair, having a table without a lip underneath might be helpful to me. So it's planning details like that. And then also making sure or seeing if staff are comfortable with providing basic assistance during meetings, you know, refilling water glasses or moving some of the paperwork around. And then also, as I said, clarifying reimbursement policies early um, and maybe planning or budgeting for someone to have an attendant along with them if they need that for board travel or business. And so this is the table of contents for the county board governance toolkit that I'm developing. I'm hoping for it to be available relatively soon. It's being evaluated by our internal teams, but I did want to share the table of contents with you all. And a lot of the material from this presentation comes from the bullet points we're coming from the content that is in the toolkit. And, you know, beyond what we've discussed, I, I talk a little bit about, or I'll talk more about, a little bit more about the ethics of serving on county boards, but that might also be addressed more in depth in a future research. This is a great toolkit when you see it. It's very detailed. It'll give you a lot of information. I think a lot of things we're not saying you'll find in here, but it will walk you through truly scenarios and thoughts. And I remember reading it when Nate gave it to me. I'm like, this is actually really good because sometimes, no offense, department puts out stuff that you scratch your head and go, what? I don't even know what that is. But Nate's correct. It may be another year before they send it out officially, approval, but it's a good, when it comes out, it'll be a great kit for people. Yes. And, it, and I think the toolkit is meant to be a foundational resource to help develop other things to support it. And I think also county boards might be inspired to develop local resources based on the toolkit, which is really my goal is for us all to think about, you know, different ways we all can contribute to this and add to the conversation. And so I'm excited to see where it goes. And, and I think I've heard you all loud and clear that you want to know more about, you know, how it works with attendance and executive session, how you know, the guardianship piece works for eligibility to serve on a county board, and then also when somebody might have a conflict of interest, and we're working to address those things. So it's interesting, Latasha on my board and was, I didn't think about this, was not her own guardian. And about the fifth month in as we're voting on things, I'm like, can she vote legally? She's not her own guardian. But you can. I do some research and the attorney says, yes, you still could be on a board and vote for things. But I, in the head, I started wondering, if you're not your own guardian, could you really vote on board issues? And you can, but it was a, a nervousness for me saying, because we had one vote that was like four to three. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that could make it a three to three tie if she couldn't vote. And But it was 
good legal. We just have a couple minutes. Do you want to see those questions? Yes. Yep, that's fine. Any questions? I'll just run back. This has given me a lot to think about. And honestly, you answered a lot of my questions in your slides, which I think is why not as many people had questions because you did such a good job answering them. But the one thing that I was thinking is, do you know of, or are you including in your toolkit, any kind of resources um, that just goes through some of the like board stuff that could be intimidating to someone who doesn't spend a lot of time at board meetings, like Robert's rules and things where somebody might go into a board meeting and say, Oh, like, I don't know how that works. I don't know how to do that. Um, is there a yeah, accessible, that, that, inclusive it, resource for that? Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bump into you. I apologize. You're totally that, fine. That's certainly an area I've identified as future resource exploration. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Nate, for putting this together and doing a wonderful presentation. It's always my pleasure to come and speak to you all. And I thank Steve for being my wingman and you all for being such a good listening audience. Is it fun? Yeah, it is. Yep. Thank you so much, Steve, or Steve and Nate for being here. We really appreciate this. And this is not going to be a conversation that's going to end here. 